Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Todd Clint's SharePoint podcast number 230, recorded live from a frozen igloo on January 5th, 2015. 2015. Uh, I am your host, uh, and not this season's bachelor, Todd Clint. We'll uh, come back to that later. Uh, but what I am is a happy employee of Rackspace. Those guys do all kinds of great stuff, including sending me um, paychecks every week. And so um, I'm a big fan of Rackspace. You, too, can become a big fan of Rackspace. If you listen to this podcast, you're probably doing some SharePoint or some Exchange or, or something like that. So you can go to SharePoint.Rackspace.com and find out about all the great things that we do uh, at Rackspace around SharePoint. We have dedicated SharePoint and uh, hosted SharePoint. We do SharePoint consulting. We've got SharePoint videos. we got all kinds of great stuff. So you can find all that at SharePoint.Rackspace.com. So for production notes, let's uh, let's start with that. Last week, Shane and I did the whole year in review thing. That was a big, big fun time. I think I actually got all that stuff out here within the last day or two. I'm horrible at the production side of this thing. Um, but got that out, it went. But tonight's episode almost uh, didn't happen for a couple of reasons. Number one, here in the frozen Northland that is Iowa, the place that I call home, it is cold. Uh, it is very cold. And uh, temperatures in the single digits, zero-ish, nothing I can't handle, don't get me wrong, but it does slow things down a little bit. And then it started snowing today, and I think we're projected to get six to eight inches of snow, something like that. And so I had to go out in the cold and the blow and, uh, and and clear some snow tonight. I live on a corner lot. I got a three car garage. It's a lot of work. Um, so I was kind of exhausted about after that. So I almost I almost had a snow day. Almost uh, uh, called it off. And then the other thing that's competing is right now directly above my head and over to the left a little bit. Um, my wife is watching The Bachelor. Now, we don't normally watch The Bachelor. Honest to goodness, I'd tell you if we did. I'm not ashamed of that kind of stuff. Uh, a little shame, but not a lot. Uh, but The Bachelor this year uh, on the TV show, for those of you who have the good sense not to watch stuff like The Bachelor, they, they take some random guy who apparently is such a catch that he can't find a woman of his own, and they throw him in this TV show with 30 women who are, again, such tremendous catches that they don't have... Any, anyway, and then they put him in this completely phony environment where they're all fighting for the same guy. Call it reality TV. And then at the end, uh, the bachelor picks his favorite uh, woman in the crowd. They live happily after, ever after till like the reunion show, and then they never get married. Great piece of television work. But anyway, uh, this year's bachelor is from Iowa, which for us Iowans, that's kind of cool. There's only, you know, three or four million of us. We don't get out much. And so there's a guy from Iowa on The Bachelor. They filmed a bunch of stuff for it this summer. So there's going to be a bunch of local places. So my wife's upstairs watching The Bachelor and going to let me know if we see any familiar stuff. Um, Bear Gal, th 34 in the chat room, is talking about Iowa. Uh, we, we're flyover country now. Um, depending on which way she's, uh, f her, her handle being Bear Gal, I'm guessing that uh, she's a Chicago Bear fan. Uh, and I think I know who it is from the name. But yeah, Iowa is famous for people flying over it, either east to west or if you're going from Chicago to Minneapolis, uh, north to south. But um uh, Anyway, that's that's big news for us folks here in Iowa. Also, another big thing, though it didn't compete with uh, with tonight's netcast. Last night's season premiere of the Celebrity Apprentice, Sean Johnson was on there. Also from Iowa, she uh, did some Olympic stuff, won the Women's Gymnastics Olympics or something. She's a big superstar here in Iowa. She's on that, so you can really get your fill of Iowa watching Celebrity Bachelor or Celebrity Apprentice and watching The Bachelor, watching this deal. Big. Big times for Iowa right now. Uh, Lori in the chat room, not only was she on Dancing with the Stars, she won Dancing with the Stars. She was on Dancing with the Stars twice. She won it once and came in second uh, one of the time. So we Iowans, hardworking, honest folks, love our reality TV shows. So, But tonight's netca netcast almost didn't happen because so enthralled in all the uh, all the Iowaness. But you guys are here. Uh, I like you, so we're going to go ahead and, uh, and get started. I forgot to start my timer tonight, so son of a gun, I forgot how. Anyway, so, but we, we're here. I got some notes. Uh, we'll, oops, forget about that. Oh, I used last. 
<laughs> I forgot to change my slide, and so I don't have a topic slide. That is sweet. Well prepared. So uh, what I was going to say was I took like the last two or three weeks off from work. Rackspace has this great deal where if you don't take your vacation, they take your vacation. <laughs> they just take it away from you, which sounds really bad, but it's really good because it forces you to take your vacation. So... So there we go. So I'm taking my vacation. So I took the last couple of weeks off last month, so I haven't really done a lot lately. So I don't have a lot of great meaty SharePoint stuff to talk about this week. Dug into some today, and uh, and so I'll have some great stuff for you last week. But there, that doesn't mean I don't have anything to talk about. Don't get yourself wrong and ignore that. That should say topics, but I don't have a slide that says topics right now. So we're just going to have to stick with that one. We'll fix that in post, whatever, however whoever. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about was a blog post that I published a couple of days ago. Those of you who've been listening to the, the, the podcast for a while know that I've been uh, playing a lot with windows and tablets and stuff, uh, stuff like that. And so I have a, uh, another tablet that I've been playing with. So just going to give you a recap because I've kind of got like a sickness or something. My love affair with tablets kind of started with the Surface Pro and the Surface RT a couple of weeks ago or a couple of years ago. But what really got me excited was these small tablets. And the very first one that I got was a Dell Venue 8 Pro. And this has kind of been the, the, the cream of the crop. It's still uh, the, the, the defending champion. Uh, still my favorite one, but this was kind of expensive. This thing was like $250, um, $250 or so, but it's been well worth it. I use it all the time. It's a, it's a great little thing. And when I talk to people about what I use these tablets for, they, you know, they're like, well, why, what do you need a tablet for? I use a tablet for ev for those situations that we've all had where we were looking at something on our phone and it's just like a little small and we're like zooming in and sliding around and the, and the web page doesn't just look right or, or any time we've ever held our phone and said, man, I wish the screen was just a little bigger so I could read more. Those are exactly the kind of situations that I use uh, these tablets for. And then other stuff, you know, when I'm sitting around playing solitaire or something like that. But the, the Dell Venue 8 Pro, solid little box, uh, been, been really great for me. But one of the problems Windows 8 had when it first came out was nobody could really appreciate the Metro interface. Number one, because it stunk. But number two, because everybody was using it on desktops, laptops, and things like that. And to really understand what they were thinking with Metro, you had to try it on a touch device. But when Windows 8 came out, all the touch devices were super expensive. So you didn't know whether it was worth the money or not, and I certainly didn't. So again, I didn't play with it at all until I got the Surface RT for $100 at TechEd a couple years ago and the Surface Pro. And then it kind of started to make um, started to make some sense. But having these little tablets is great, but like this Dell Venue 8 Pro, kind of expensive, $250 or so. But one of the things that is uh, coming out now is Microsoft has relaxed the hardware requirements for Windows tablets. When Windows 8 first came out, they wanted to make sure that everybody had a great experience. So there were hardware requirements, processor, RAM, that kind of stuff. And that kept all the devices really expensive. They realized that. And so when Windows 8 1 came out, about that time, they relaxed a bunch of those things. And now we're just seeing a glut of these devices. And that's where I come in. I love these little devices. So I got the Dell. One of the ones I got shortly after that was the Toshiba Encore Mini. This was the first tablet that I ever got that was less than $100. So this is a 7-inch tablet with a dead battery. <laughs> um, a 7-inch tablet, uh, but it was, it was $99 at the Microsoft Store. And it's got 1 gig of RAM. It's got 16 gig of storage. It's got a 7-inch screen and a really crappy screen at that. But it was $99, and it came with a year of Office 365 Personal, which alone is $70 if you were going to buy it. So essentially, if you were going to buy Office 365 for 30 extra bucks, you get a tablet. And it's for, you know, for that amount of money, it's not bad. And I was impressed with how great this thing was for $100. And then some more $100 tablets started eking out. And then I realized that you don't have to have a crappy tablet for $100. And so the video that I released this week is another $100 tablet. Let's see if I did a better job charging this battery. Oh, ever so slightly. This is the uh, Insignia, which is Best Buy's house brand. This is the Insignia Flex 8 tablet. And this is, as you can tell from the name, it's an 8-inch tablet. 
So that is one inch more than the seven inch tablet, the Toshiba, and you can't, these cameras don't show. But this thing also a hundred dollars, but eight inch screen, which is uh, better than the seven inch screen, a screen that doesn't suck, which is something that the Toshiba cannot advertise. The screen on the Toshiba absolutely sucks. And while this thing only has a uh, 16 gig of storage, all these tablets come with a micro SD port on them. This little guy is the only guy that actually came with a micro SD card in it. It comes with an additional 16 gig of storage. So for a hundred dollars, um, it's got the same thing. It's got the one gig of RAM. It's got the 16 gig of storage, but it's got all kinds, of, you know, wireless, uh, 802, 11 BG and N 2.4, uh, gigahertz only, but that's, uh, that's good enough. Bluetooth 4.0. It uh, supports Miracast, which is the wireless video stuff that I uh, use once in a while. It also has a micro HDMI port on it. So if you've got one of those cheap little micro HDMI connectors, you can do that. Great a little tablet for $100. So I unboxed that video. The, the video that I just published and blogged about is the unboxing and then setting up and just kind of playing with this tablet a little bit to see what you get for $100. Turns out it's a lot. Another one of the great... Um, tablets that's out there right now is the HP Stream 7, seven inch tablet, uh, but but still a pretty good buy. Now, one of the sad things about this, this Insignia tablet, again, eight inches, comes with a micro SD card, great little device. I think it's been discontinued. Uh, if you try to buy it on the bestbuy.com webpage, it says it's out of stock. And when I got mine at my local Best Buy store, it was like on the clearance table, which is sad because that's a, a hell of a buy at, at $99. In the blog post, I linked to Amazon just because there's you know a bunch of information and stuff. And I think it's like $130 there. But still, still a great little tablet. And again, this is like like a tertiary device. So, you know, your primary device is probably your laptop, your desktop, or whatever. Your secondary device is your phone. And then this is a nice little uh, companion. And one of the things I've talked about a couple of times is if you have a Windows 8 device like this, uh, or my Surface Pro 2, or the Dell Venue 8 Pro, or whatever, and you have a Windows phone, so like a bunch of folks in the chat room have it, I have it, if you Bluetooth pair them... That's pretty cool. Uh, you can move files back and forth, all that kind of stuff. But then the tablet will keep a little placeholder for the phone's internet tethering option. So I can tether on my phone. And whether I've got tethering turned on on my phone or not, the tablet shows it. So if I'm someplace you know, outside of my house and I need internet access, I can go into my internet sites or my wireless sites and... Um, hit my phone's internet connection, and over Bluetooth, my tablet will turn internet connection sharing on on my phone and then connect to that wireless and then get through the internet through there. So I don't have to take my phone out of my pocket or do anything with that. That has been really handy, super handy. Not that it's a gigantic deal to pull my phone out of my pocket and unlock it and all that kind of stuff, um, but that's just that's just great stuff. And the other thing I, I, I found out is my, my car. I've got a, a 2013 Ford Explorer. Yeah, 2013, I think. It can also share internet. So if the people in the car want to share internet stuff, it can do the same thing with my phone. So I can go into it and I can say, turn on the internet connection sharing. It'll turn on the internet connection sharing in my phone. So under no normal circumstances, I wouldn't have any reason to Bluetooth pair my phone with my tablets. But now I do because if, if I'm ever out and about, I need internet access, just pop it and uh, it comes back up. So it's those, those nice little things there that make this whole process uh, pretty nice. But again, this tablet, you know, I've got like the Kindle client so I can read my Kindle books on there. I buy uh, digital magazines from a place called Zinio. So I do that. There's just all kinds of, uh, all kinds of great stuff. And again, for 99 bucks. And again, it come, most of these come with the uh, Office 365 personal which is $70 and that gets you Word and Excel, unlimited OneDrive, all that kind of stuff. Be careful with that though. If you already have an Office 365 subscription, there doesn't seem to be any way to like roll this into your uh, Office 365 professional or anything like that. So before you light everything up, kind of read through that, but that is an option. So sadly, <laughs> these three tablets that I've shown are not all of the tablets that I have, and I'll probably be getting rid of some of those. So be listening in the next few weeks. I'm probably going to have some kind of a drawing or something where I just ship these out, just get rid of them. I'm, I'm thinking that Toshiba. I have a couple of unholy things I want to try with that Toshiba, and then I'm probably going to reset it and give it to somebody. So be listening for that, and uh, you too can be the owner of a uh, 
cheap tablet with a crappy screen. So don't mean to get you too excited about it, but uh, it, it could all be yours. Uh, but go ahead, watch that uh, video uh, and see, uh, see what cool stuff we have. So speaking of these cheap devices, uh, there's just a ton of them out there, and I've got some other ones that I want to talk about, uh, not, not on tonight's show, but just all kinds of great things. I'm getting this idea that we're just going to have windows everywhere, and it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. But this week, I think today or tomorrow, starts CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. One bad thing about CES being in January is I always forget about it, and I always want to go, and I always mean to go, and it's a press event, so you got to do some you know work to get in there. But I always want to go just to CES and just see all the great gadgets, all the new TVs and the home automation stuff and the computers and all those great things, and I always forget about it until like yesterday. I'm like, oh, CES, doggone it. Excuse me. So I need to put a reminder in Outlook like in September to start sucking up to somebody. So that I go to CES. But for now, for this year, since I've forgotten and screwed up again, I'm forced to just sit home, go to my favorite gadget pages, you know, in gadget, slash gear, those kind of places, furiously hit F5 to see what's uh, what's going on. One of the things that I saw just tonight when I was poking around is HP. So they have that uh, Stream 7 tablet that I was talking about, another $100 tablet. They have released, or are going to release, I, I don't remember now, a, a new thing called the Stream Mini PC. And the Stream Mini PC is a little guy, and I'm trying to see if they've got the exact size specs in here. Uh, I don't see them, but we're talking a couple of inches uh, by a couple of inches. And it's just like, it's like the size of a hockey puck. But it's, it's a full computer, and it's running full Windows. And it's not, um, not horrible when it comes to hardware. And it's got a Celeron processor, which is not great. All these little tablets have Atom processors, so Celerons are kind of a step up. This uh, Stream Mini PC has 2 gig of RAM, 32 gig SSD in it. And then it's got all the other stuff. It's got Bluetooth and wireless and all that. And it's also going to come with a keyboard and a mouse and a bunch of OneDrive space. It doesn't say Office 365, so keep that in mind. But all of this for $180. And... I don't know if you guys have bought PCs lately. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably kind of a tech nerd. But for most folks, for normal folks, the PC hardware has far surpassed what they need to do uh, for day-to-day -day stuff. For browsing the web, unless you're you know, going to BuzzFeed or any of those dumb places. Check an email, that kind of stuff. Today's hardware is far past that. So this $180 computer that's about that big is good enough for most things. It would be good enough for my mom and dad. It would be good enough for my in-laws, all that kind of stuff. It's 180 bucks, and it's just an itty-bit little thing. It doesn't take a lot of power. doesn't make a lot of noise. doesn't take a lot of desk space. runs Windows. has all the connectors and everything you want on it. This is, this is a great time. And like Lori in the chat room is thinking about one for a grandmother. Perfect. And it's $180. You know, what if, you know what you do if it breaks? You buy another one for $180. I mean, there's just we're at that point now. And th so there's going to be more of these coming out. This one, particularly, the article that I read in PC World, talks about how it's kind of a Chromebook killer. And I kind of see that. So I've got all these tablets. And I don't do a lot with them, but I do a little bit. But I don't back them up because they're mostly just terminals to cloud stuff for me now. All the files that I deal with, I save in OneDrive. If I do any picture taking with these, which I don't, because people who take pictures with a... Uh, with a tablet or normally dorks, but if I do, they're automatically synced up to OneDrive. So these devices themselves really don't have any information on them that I care about. They're just interfacing the cloud. And that's what Chromebooks are like. Chromebooks are just, you know, it's like a web OS. It doesn't really have much locally, though they've started to trickle a little bit uh, local because you need some stuff for offline use. But that's kind of where Windows is going now with OneDrive and all these little boxes that are cheap. So this $180 box breaks. It used to be if your computer died, you're like, oh, I haven't backed it up since, you know, a year ago last April and all, where are all my pictures going to go and all that. It's not, Nobody does that anymore because all that stuff's in OneDrive, so you can get away with these little uh, little cheap machines. So it's uh, it's a great time to be to be doing this. And I've talked before uh, to some people's um, uh, discontent or maybe it grosses them out a little bit about all the different places that I use these tablets now because they're just so cheap. 
and there's nothing on them, and they don't, you know, there's $100, there's not much to them. So I've got these little things everywhere, and now we're starting to have these small computers. These are going to be great little, um, you know, high-tech uh, or a home theater PCs, things like that, all this kind of stuff, all these places where we used to want to put computers, but they were too big or too noisy or too expensive. Um, you know, now we can do it. So I, I wait more of that. We'll, we'll see what's out there. But uh, $180, and I think I think next week's podcast will probably have some more cool CS stuff. But I like this trend. I like the trend of cheap tablets. I like the trend of small, uh, cheap computers because it's uh, that's the way it ought to be. You know, just put it somewhere, tack it on behind your monitor, forget about it, and uh, and move out. So I'm very excited about that uh, that kind of stuff. Another great consumer electronic story that I read this last week was about Windows 10. So to get you all up to speed, for those of you who've been uh, living under a rock or, or, or whatever, Windows 10 is in a public preview, and you can get it for free. I think if you go to preview.windows.com, you can sign up and get the free public preview of Windows 10. installs right on top of Windows 8, right on top of Windows 7 and you can see what those folks at Microsoft are doing. In a couple of weeks, there's going to be a big event in Redmond, and they're going to have some new stuff. They're going to be showing some new features on Windows 10. But the great deal about this preview, well, there's several great deals about it. Number one is unlike betas of the past, and let's be honest, this preview is just a beta. Unlike betas of the past, this uh, preview updates itself. So you don't have to worry about, you know, you install the preview today, and then a new build comes out next week, and you got to reinstall everything. The beta, the preview of Windows 10 actually just updates itself to the next build, which is uh, great. So you don't have to keep reinstalling. They have also said that the preview build of Windows 10 will upgrade to RTM, which is amazing. You still shouldn't use it for super important production work, but that's still really cool that you'll be able to jump to RTM. And then the thing that I linked this week was if you have Windows 7 on your box, so I've got one box here at home still running Windows 7, that will be able to upgrade directly to Windows 10 when Windows 10 RTMs. So all kinds of good stuff around Windows 10. For most folks, the big advantage to Windows 10 is it brings back the start menu. Windows 8 had the start screen, and it was uh, much hated and reviled. Windows 8.1 added the start button, which really just took you to the start screen so that you could start reviling it. Windows 10 has the option of hitting the, uh, the start button going to the start screen, which is great for tablets and other things that are finger friendly, or having the start menu, which is great for desktops, mouse machines, things like that. So there's a whole bunch of really great things in Windows 10, but that's going to be the big one. That's the one that's going to sell people on it, is that. The other great thing that I love about Windows 10 is uh, Metro apps can be windowed, so they don't have to take up the whole screen. Right now in Windows 8.1, if I've got music, you know, the music app going, it takes up a whole screen somewhere, which is kind of unnecessary. Windows 10 will allow you to do that, put those in Windows. If you want to do that today, if you're running Windows 8 and don't want to get the Windows 10 preview, you can uh, get that windowed functionality with one of the things from Stardock. And I forget the name of it. It's like $5, but it will let you, among other things, let you window uh, Metro apps, which is nice. Lynn in the chat room. Good to see Lynn. Normally this time of year, Lynn and I are out at the New Media Expo, but uh, I didn't go this year, and I don't think Lynn did either. But she's asking if they have announced a price yet for Windows 10. I have not seen a price for Windows 10. And the price itself is not uh, much of a story because we kind of have an idea-ish what that's going to cost. Um, but there's been a lot of speculation about what paths will be to free upgrades. And as far as I know, Microsoft has not said anything about any of this. So this is all speculation. But a lot of people are thinking that they're going to try to get folks off of Windows 8 or Windows 8.1 as quickly as they can. So there is some hope or speculation that there will be more free upgrade paths to Windows 10 because they just want to get you off of those old ones. Lori uh, reminded me in the chat room that third-party program that you can buy to window Metro apps is called Modern Mix. And a great little program. It's like $5 or something like that, but it lets you do some, some uh, nice things inside of Windows 8. But don't know about Windows 10. Windows 10, I think all we know is that it's going to come out sometime this year. I think the last I heard was sometime... Um, later in the year, something like that. So uh, Lynn's telling me they moved the New Media Expo NMX to April. You know, now that you mentioned that, 
that sounds familiar because I did look it up. But that's about the same time as Ignite in Chicago, so I probably won't be going there, or the uh, SharePoint Evolution Conference, which is in April also. So I probably won't make it this year. And honestly, the New Media Expo was great. I went there two years in a row, saw Lynn there, which was uh, was, was a good time, got, got to hang out with her for a couple of years. Some great advice there and some things that have rolled into this. I'm on YouTube now because of the New Media Expo, uh, things like that. But at this point, I kind of feel like I'm the weak link, not the New Media Expo. Like, like it's not like I've run out of ways to make this thing better. <laughs> it's not like I'm going to go to the go to NMX and learn the next thing. I need to implement some of the other things that I've already learned. So I'm kind of sitting this one out. Uh, Surya in the chat room is asking, is it possible to revert back from Windows 10 to 8 just in case I have to? I do not believe that is possible. I would not expect that to work. It makes a lot of changes. Um, on w with Windows 8 and, and w something that I've done with all my devices, you can make a recovery drive. So, I mean, you could go back that way and just blast Windows 10 and put Windows 8 on. Of course, you got to reinstall everything then, uh, copy all your documents down. But one of the great things about Windows 8 is if you let it, if you either log in with a Microsoft account or link your domain account to a Microsoft account, a bunch, we'll call it most, of your settings get saved to OneDrive. So while reinstalling your machine is a gigantic pain in the, the patoot, it's not as big of a pain as it was with previous versions of Windows. You log into Windows, you give it your Microsoft thing, it sends you a text message on your phone to make sure you're really you, and then when you come up, all your backgrounds are there and all your shortcuts and all that stuff are there. And as you start installing programs, it remembers where things are at. It's a lot less traumatic experience than it was with previous versions of Windows. So if you did put Windows 10 on, I think you'd like it. But if you didn't and you needed to blast back to Windows 8 uh, or 8.1, I think you'd find it's not, not that big of a deal. Back everything up, all that, but I think it's, uh, it's not so bad. Excuse me, all this talking makes my throat dry. So while uh, the year 2015 will be the year of the Ignite Conference, which I'm with, uh, I'm with Beth in the chat room, very excited about that. Now that the year is uh, started and people are back to work, I'm starting to get emails about Ignite. People about talking about wanting to do things. I'm getting excited. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie to you. So 2015 will be the year of Ignite. There's gonna be some rough spots. That's a uh, that's a really big conference. They're expecting 20,000 people there. Th there'll be some complaining. There'll be some legitimate things, but it's gonna be awesome, and I'm I'm really excited about that. 2015 will also be the year of Windows 10. We've already heard about that. I also want to go on the record that I think 2015 will be the year that SharePoint hybrid environments really become a thing, really become mainstream. Microsoft started promoting that, started talking about that last year. I think 2015 is really when it's going to it's going to hit. And there's a couple of things that make me think that. One of the problems that customers have always had when moving to SharePoint Online, Office 365, is BI things, business intelligence things. Because if SharePoint's not in the same environment that your data is, it's tough for SharePoint to go through all that. And SharePoint Online has customarily been pretty weak on the BI stuff. And as the years have gone by, they've started tightening some of that up and filling in some of those gaps. And one of the things that they recently announced was you can now connect Power BI, which is the BI tool in Office 365, to on-premises SQL with a new tool. Now, the tool is in preview. It's a beta, so you know take that for what it's worth. But now there's this way for you to run a process on your local network that can access the data that you want stuff done to, and you can use Power BI to sift it and surface it and do all kinds of great things. That is just one more reason for people to start moving things that make sense into SharePoint Online and into Office 365 because now there's that whole, the, the, the excuse, well, I can't get to my BI tools. That's slowly, uh, slowly eroding. So I think 2015 will be the year that SharePoint hybrid really, really starts to make sense for a lot of places. Another thing, and this is something that happened a few months ago, but uh, I, I didn't talk about then and I want to talk about a little bit now, is they, Microsoft has released a new tool 
uh, Azure AD Sync that makes syncing accounts between on-premises AD and Azure AD easier. So now it's easier for you to have your local domain that does stuff, you know, file shares, whatever, your um, highly secure SharePoint data, domain accounts, but now an easy way to bolt that up to SharePoint Online so that your users use the same username and password on-prem and online. And there have been various tools in the past that did that. Dursync did it. FIM did it. FIM, if you've ever had the pleasure, FIM can be a bit fussy to work with. And I'm not talking about like the user profile service in SharePoint. I'm talking about real FIM, like the real deal FIM. Super scary, super complicated, but you needed that if you had multiple on-prem domains that needed to, I mean, there, there were places you just needed it. Last year, September, October-ish, something like that, Microsoft released this new tool, this Azure AD Sync tool, that greatly simplifies this whole process. So now you can have your on-prem accounts, and they can be your home of record. They can be your authoritative authentication thing. But now your users can use this to get into Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, whatever. And that's just that makes the hybrid thing that much easier, the having a single unified identity and being able to easily move things back and forth. So they're just they're, they're getting it all. And this was one of these things, you know, five years ago when they started hitting SharePoint Online really hard, we had this whole list of things that just didn't work very well. And authentication was one of them. BI was one of them. They're chipping away at it. They're, 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 they're getting there. And I think it's, it's exciting. I, I didn't like it at first because I'm an on-prem guy. I mean, that's what I've done for 20 years now. But this idea of hybrid stuff and, and uh, uh, identity, authentication, Figuring out where to put the, it's it's exciting stuff. I'm I'm looking forward to it. So one of the things that I'm going to be playing with a lot, lot more in the coming months is just where hybrid makes sense and and how to do it. So if if you're on the fence, and if you looked at it at Office 365 a year ago and had some problems, look again. They may have uh, they may have, may have fixed all that. So very exciting stuff. Now I will skip to a section of the podcast that I actually have a slide for. So. Got that going for me. Uh, you're starting to warm up. We got things going on in a month. Oh my God, is it only a month away? Well, a month and three days is SP TechCon. That is the the twice a year conference that the folks at BZ Media put on. It used to be in uh, San Francisco the first half of the year, Boston the second half of the year. This year they're changing things a little bit, shaking it up. Those guys are crazy over there at BZ Media. Now they're putting it in Austin. So uh, February 8th through the 11th, SP TechCon will be in Austin, Texas. I'm going to be there. Shane and I are doing four sessions. We're doing administrator skills session upgrades, uh, part one and part two, the sequel. You don't want don't to miss that one. And then our fourth session is troubleshooting techniques for SharePoint. So things we've learned over the years, how to troubleshoot SharePoint. Uh, we'll all be, they'll also have the lightning talks and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. I haven't talked to them yet about doing the netcast from there. Uh, we'll probably try to find a way to do that. That conference is always so busy and people always uh, have other stuff going on. So I need to, but, but with Shane and I both there, there's nobody to fill in. So probably we'll do something, but it's uh, there's just so much going on on those Monday nights. But that's SP TechCon. You can go to sptechcon.com and find out all about that. Not only will I be there, Laura Ro uh, Rogers, she's in the chat room. She's going to be there. Lori Gowan, she's in the chat room. She's going to be there. And I think that's it for for folks. But but it's a bunch of the folks that are you know that are here in the chat room. The the netcast hooligans all going to be there. It's 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 like having a high school reunion twice a year and meeting all your friends. It's uh, it's a good time. SP TechCon, if you haven't signed up yet, go out there and sign up for it. It's a great little uh, boutique conference. It's very personal. You get to talk to people. You get to hang out with people. It's not not 20,000 people like Ignite, and it's uh, it's a good time. They do a great show. Appreciate those folks uh, inviting me along every year. Then I get a little bit of rest, not much, but then in April, I'll be going to London, England, a uh, little place uh, that direction. Maybe you've heard of it. Get a few people there, some stuff going on. For the SharePoint Evolution Conference, that is April 20th through the 22nd. Very, very excited about that one. This is my very first SharePoint Evolution Conference. Steve Smith from Combined Knowledge over there, 
one of the consistently strong rock star type folks in the SharePoint community. He's done teaching. He's been an MVP for 107 years. I think he was originally like a fire MVP or maybe a wheel MVP. I don't remember, but he's been around forever and he's just a, uh, one of the bedrocks of the SharePoint community. He puts this conference on every year. Last year, because putting a regular conference on wasn't uh, challenging enough for Steve anymore. He's done it so many times. He put a traveling road show together and actually drove people around uh, Britain and put this put mini conferences on everywhere. The man is insane. But anyway, this year I get to go to SharePoint Evolution and do my upgrade sessions. So very excited about that. If you're in Europe, or even if you're not in Europe, Go to SharePointEvolutionConference.com. Sign up for the SharePoint Evolution Conference. Come see me and all the great speakers. Lori will be there as well. Uh, Laura Rogers will be there too. And a whole bunch of other people. You just can't go wrong with this conference. And again, it's my first time. Super excited. Hope I don't screw up. Hope I uh, you know, don't get excited like a little dog, run around, wet myself, whatever. It's a, it's a great one. So still... Uh, Still looking at that, so good time. And then hopefully Ignite. Hopefully I'll get uh, invited to Ignite. That is March, not March. That is May 4th through the 8th, I believe, in Chicago, Illinois. Yep, May 4th through the 8th, thank you. It's the big one. It's the SharePoint conference. It's the Exchange conference. It's the Link conference. It's MMS. It's Tech Ed. It's the Westminster Dog Show. It is everything rolled up in one one big gooey Microsoft conference in Chicago. And I was happy, I was lucky to be asked to be part of their planning session. So Laura and I went down there a couple of months ago, toured the facilities, talked to the folks that are going to be putting it on from Microsoft. They've got some great ideas. It's going to be a blast. And so if you only get to go to one conference this year and, you, and you're not in Europe and you don't get to go to SharePoint Evolution, you got to get to uh, the Microsoft Ignite conference, and they haven't announced anything, so I don't know if I'm going to get any speaking spots there. But I'm telling you, I'm doing everything. I'm bribing folks. I'm trying to get incriminating pictures, whatever it takes. It will be that great. If I have to walk there, I will do it. It's going to be that cool. So hopefully, I'll I'll see you guys there. Um, so that is it. Looks like we're about uh, 35, 36 minutes, so not too bad. Again, next week we'll have a lot more content because I'm actually doing SharePoint this week, which is uh, a good change as opposed to just sitting around eating Christmas candy, wearing my uh, my Santa Claus robe and uh, reindeer boxers and all that. So thanks, everybody. Uh, the chat room, you guys have been great tonight. I'll stick around for a while. You don't need to head out just yet. But you, as always, you can find me uh, at toddclint.com. On the web, at Todd Clint in Twitter, uh, YouTube.com slash Todd Clint Netcast. Uh, I'm, I'm all over. I'm, I'm, I'm huge on the Internet. Just ask my mom. She thinks Bill Gates and I play golf and, you know, do stuff like that. Um, so reach out to me if, you, if it's something you'd like to hear me talk about on here, whatever. Um, love to hear from you. So thanks, everybody. Have a happy new year. Uh, great to see you guys in 2015, and I'll see you next week.